Live from the Civic Media World Headquarters in Madison, Wisconsin, it's the Todd Alba Show. And now, pursuing truth wherever it may lead, here's your host, Todd Alba. Good morning across the Civic Media Radio Network and streaming worldwide on the Civic Media app. I'm Todd Alba. It is Thursday, May 18th, 2023. Glad to have you along with us on a Thursday. For our producer and engineer, Mr. Aaron Zomer is along with us. Hour number two is upon us, Mr. Zomer. Away we go. Here we are. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, coming up in hour number three, next hour uh, at 10.15, uh, our wonderful friend, an ongoing contributor on this show, Kira Saban, life coach and positivity psychologist, will be along with us. <laughs> yes, always makes us feel better when Kira is here, talking about kind of uh, things that, uh, uh, reasons that we get attracted to both things good and bad, both in personal relationships, life and habits, and how we can kind of improve those things. Always, I always feel like I could do better in life after... Kira visits us on the show. She'll be along next hour at hour number three. And importantly, it's feeling like you can do better in life as in, I can do better in life, <laughs> right. not I need to do better in life. Right. It, it's a positive feeling. Yeah. Well, she is a positivity, uh, positivity psychologist, so she knows her business. She knows her craft. She knows how to uh, help us improve ourselves. So we will certainly do that with Kira Saban in hour number three. Uh, this hour, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, Robin Voss and the Assembly Republicans and shared revenue and bills and negotiations with the governor. Robin Voss says he's done. He is done negotiating with uh, the governor and Democrats. They have passed what they're going to pass, and they want to move forward. So we'll be talking about that. Also, I'll take a little time to talk about uh, NIL. Name, or NIL, 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 name, like the, try that again, Todd. Name, likeness, and image. NLI. Or name, image, and likeness. NIL. I had it right the first time. Name, image, and likeness. In college sports. Meaning that if you are a college athlete now in the NCAA, you can essentially cut your own deal. A lot of college athletes now are cutting deals with car dealerships to get brand new cars. Or you can cut a deal, uh, an ad with a, a soda company. You can cut an ad with a, a local bakery if you want. All different levels of this, but is it kind of like the Wild West now with name, image, and likeness? We'll talk about that, that this half hour as well. Uh, before we do that, just a quick check of the weather. Around the state where you are, first of all, WRCE News from the Center in Richland Center in the southwest. Partly sunny today, a high near 75 degrees. Then for tonight, showers, a low of 52. And tomorrow, Friday, partly sunny and a high near 61. Up in Wausau, Bull Falls Radio, WXCO, partly sunny today. A chance of showers, a high of 72. Then for tonight, a low of 49. Heavy rain possible up in Wausau tonight. For tomorrow, a chance of showers and a high near 59 degrees. Over in Amory, WLAK, Lake Air Radio, a chance for showers today. A high of 68, increasing shower chances in the afternoon. Then for tonight, a thunderstorm is possible and a low near 43. Tomorrow, partly sunny and a high near 58 up in Amory, Wisconsin. Want to finish up uh, just we were, uh, I was up against the clock there last hour. Before we move on, just want to finish up this last thought from Rick Wilson, who was talking about the story in The Guardian, talking about the fact that uh, Republicans, current Republican Party leadership, really fears Donald Trump. And Rick Wilson, head of or co-founder of the Lincoln Project, who has been on this program, of course, author of Everything Trump Touches Dies, he said this. He said, these are very transactional and tactical approaches, meaning going to, going to Trump and just saying, please play nice. But nonetheless, they are approaches that these people are willing to do to survive the war with Trump. He added... There is no Republican Party. It's just Trump. It is only about his desires and his political power, his political goals. If you told the average Republican elected official you have to cut off your arm to get endorsement from Trump, they're going to ask you for a saw and some Band-Aids. <laughs> That's a pretty powerful line. But it's, unfortunately, it is true. That's where we are. And as a former Republican myself, for 30 years, having left the party in 2011, there were elements of a former Republican party 
that were good. As I've said before, there was a time in this country in the 60s when the Republican Party helped Lyndon Johnson pass the Civil Rights Act. There was a time when the Republican Party actually stood for inclusion in this country. It's been a long time, but it did. I agree with Rick Wilson. There is no true Republican Party in that vein anymore. It is only Trump and Trumpism. I left the party before Trumpism even started. I left over voter, so-called voter ID laws, which were meant to suppress the vote. I simply said I can't do that anymore. I can't be part of a party that willingly, openly, and happily wants to take away other people's votes so they can stay in power. I believe whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent or a Green Party or Libertarian, you should run on your ideas. Your ideas should connect with the majority of the people you want to elect you. You should say, my ideas can make all of our lives better. That's how it's supposed to work. You're supposed to appeal to people's best hopes. And they say, well, that person, that, that, I identified that person. There's some good things there. We could, we could try that. And you vote for them. And instead now what we have, particularly on the Republican side, is this fear. And that's what we have to get past. We have to start voting for positivity, for hope, for good things. And not appeal to our worst things. Come back and talk about Robin Voss and what's happening in the state of Wisconsin and the state capitol. Back after this on the Todd Ball Show on the Civic Media Radio Network. Show it is now 9:15 on the Civic Media Radio Network. Thank you, Mrs. Summers. Good tunes for us on the board this morning. Got to have somebody to lean on, right? And, and why not each other, right? I mean, that, that, that's one of the things. I spent some time out in Richland Center yesterday. And, and by the way, we had uh, we had promoted that uh, patriotic millionaires would be on the show today. Uh, a little bit of adjustment in the in the lineup. They're going to be joining us soon, just not today. Spent some time out in southwest Wisconsin yesterday with one of those folks, Erica Payne, author of uh, this fine book, Tax the Rich, How Lies, Loopholes, and Lobbyists Made the Rich Even Richer. Right here in my hot little hands. Uh, we're going to have Erica Payne on the show coming up here in the next few days. Just a scheduling conflict. She had to do uh, an early flight uh, back to D.C. today, so was not able to join us this morning, but she will be soon. And got out in, you know, back in my hometown, Richland Center, and talked to some folks on the ground. And that's, you know, I've said this before. The more you get out and talk to people around the state and talk to real people, <laughs> meaning, you know, and what I mean by that is I'm a real person, but I'm following news and content and everything all day long. It's my job. And trying to winnow and sift out, you know, what what I feel is important and pertinent to you and pass it along and give you factual information. That's the, the, one of the hallmarks of this show, one of the hallmarks of this network. And then there are people in politics, local, or elected officials of Madison and staff, and they're kind of in this bubble under the Capitol. But I'm talking about people like just on the street, people who are just listening to music, walking their dog, going to, uh, going to work, putting food at the table for their kids, Folks like that aren't just absorbed with news all the time. And when you talk to real people like that that aren't absorbed with the news all the time, you get a fresh perspective and a hopeful perspective. People are just out raising money for the local Kiwanis or Rotary to do a community project. People who are making a difference in their communities. And that's certainly what keeps me hopeful. We thank all of you who are doing that each and every day, and we support you 100%. A couple of news headlines for you this hour. 
President Joe Biden arrived in Japan today for the G7 summit, an annual gathering of leaders for some of the world's largest economies, to discuss pressing issues on the global stage. Members of the G7, which include France, Germany, Italy, the UK, Canada, Japan, and the US, will participate in meetings over the next several days to bolster allies amid China's growing military and economic ambitions and support Ukraine amid Russia's invasion. Biden is set to hold a press conference on Sunday before returning to Washington to continue negotiations over raising the U.S. debt ceiling. Montana has become the first U.S. state to ban TikTok, but the controversial legislation is expected to face a slew of legal challenges. Montana's Republican governor, Greg Gainfort, signed the bill yesterday prohibiting the app from operating within state lines beginning in January. The law also outlines potential fines up to $10,000 a day for violators, including app stores found to host the social media app. By the way, Mr. Zomers, Mr. Perry checked in this morning, said that uh, also if you get caught with lockjaw in Montana, it's also a $10,000 fine. <laughs> you know? I, I did not know that. <laughs> Somehow, uh, I think there's a joke to be had there, and it went over my head. <laughs> I, 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 Jeff is a highbrow writer, so you know, but no, it's just, yeah, you, know, you don't want to get caught with lockjaw anywhere. Uh, classified documents. The National Archives are informed, uh, uh, has informed f former President Donald Trump that it will hand over documents to a special counsel showing that Trump and his top advisors had knowledge of the correct declassification process while he was president. According to multiple, multiple sources, Trump and his allies have insisted as president he did not follow a specific process to declassify the documents that were later found at his Mar-a-Lago residence. And Florida Governor Ron DeSantis yesterday signed a new law, a new bill into law, including restrictions on gender-affirming treatments for minors, drag shows, bathroom usage, and which pronouns can be used in schools. He thinks that's the platform that's going to launch him on his presidential debate or presidential ambitions. Reports are this morning, DeSantis is going to launch his presidential bid next week. And now breaking across the CBS wires this morning, North Dakota Republican Governor Doug Burgum, a likely run for president, a potential Republican as potential Republican contenders, including DeSantis, former Vice President Mike Pence, and South Carolina t uh, Senator Tim Scott, move closer to announcing their entries into the GOP presidential fray. Another potential candidate is also likely to be throwing his hat into the ring. CBS has learned this morning that North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum is nearing the decision to launch a dark horse bid for the White House and has begun hiring potential consultants, uh, potential political consultants who have advised previous Republican presidential campaigns, according to GOP sources familiar with the planning. I always wanted to be one of those people, you know, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a source familiar, but off the record. Well, there you go. And, and remember, every time you get one of these kind of very dark horse, meaning, meaning, dark horse, meaning they just don't have much of a shot. Don't say never. I mean, Bill Clinton was a dark horse candidate for president in 1992. He got to be in the White House for eight years. So it can happen. But every time one of these kind of substandard candidates gets in, it divides up the Republican vote in all these primaries, which only makes Trump stronger as they go through the process. We shall see. It is 922 this morning, turning to our next topic of the morning. In the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel today, Great reporting by Allison Durr and Molly Beck, entitled Assembly Speaker Voss, Republican Caucus is, quote unquote, done negotiating on local government funding bill. Assembly Speaker Robert Voss yesterday said his caucus was done negotiating on sweeping legislation Republican lawmakers passed yesterday, actually late last night, early this morning, aimed at boosting funding for local governments that the Democratic governor said he wanted to continue discussing. Assembly Republicans yesterday released revisions to a bill that boosts state funding, known as shared revenue, and implements policy changes in communities across the state on policing, public health, quarries, and more. The revisions were made just before lawmakers were set to meet on the Assembly floor and vote on the legislation. Governor Tony Evers... Yesterday said he was optimistic 
about finding a compromise supported by both house by both houses of the legislature, stakeholders, and his office. But by the end of the day, Voss said discussions were over. Even as Governor Evers' spokeswoman said the governor was looking forward to continuing them. Quote, we have negotiated in good faith, literally for months. Now it's time to act, Voss told reporters before the floor session. Quote, nothing has changed since the governor's statements this morning. The governor has not signed off on any amendment. But he looks forward to continuing negotiations with Republican leaders in the weeks ahead. Evers spokesperson Britt Kudabak said in a statement minutes later. The bill was passed 56 to 36, with all Democrats opposing and three Republicans opposing the proposal. Republican Representatives Scott Allen of Waukesha, Janelle Brandigan of Menominee Falls, and Chuck Wichkers of Muskego join Democrats to vote against the bill. Democrats echo the governor's desire to keep negotiations, negotiating rather, its provisions, and citing the speed at which the legislation was taken up after being amended. The bill author, our own Tony Kurtz, Republican of Waniwak in southwest Wisconsin, said the bill was a result of months of negotiations, including a rare meeting of Evers, Voss, and Senate Majority Leader Devin Lemahue. Quote, to let this opportunity go truly hurts the entire state of Wisconsin, Kurt said. It's something that has taken decades to get to. The legislation could, keyword could change further once the state Senate takes it up. Majority Leader Lemonhue has questioned the wisdom of the Assembly proposal's requirement that the new Milwaukee and Milwaukee County sales tax be implemented only if approved by voters. He did not say yesterday whether he supports the Assembly's approach. I believe in other reporting, his official comment was no comment. <laughs> the bill would allow the city of Milwaukee to levy a sales tax and the county to add its current sales tax to address pension challenges and public safety services if approved by voters and would move their new employees to the state pension system. So this is very interesting. Because it's unusual, until recently, to have the two Republican leaders of the Assembly and the Senate kind of openly disagreeing with each other. It's happened before. Certainly when my former boss, Dale Schultz, was majority leader in the mid-2000s, and you had uh, uh, John Gard as the Republican speaker from Peshtigo at the time, they certainly disagreed on, believe me, behind closed doors. There were some pretty heated telephone conversations between the two, usually more heated on, on Speaker Guard's side than my boss's side. But the difference is when reporters asked him something in public, they usually were deferential and said, we're working on it, we'll see. But in this case, you have Voss and Lemmyhue, Voss, the Speaker of the Assembly, Republican, and Lemmy Hugh, Majority Leader of the Senate Republican. I, I'm not sure. I don't want to say something's not true. I don't know if they just don't like each other, if their staff doesn't get along, if their caucuses don't like each other. It would seem to me that a vast majority of the state Senate now has come from the state assembly, which is not necessarily unusual. But certainly there have been times when state Senators have gotten elected directly to the state Senate without ever having served in the Assembly. But there's an interesting dynamic because this bill raises shared revenue to about 10%. But it, it does not even keep up with inflation. And the question that a lot of folks have asked is, why didn't Republicans, if they're so adamant about raising shared revenue... Why don't they go as far as the governor wants? And of course, why didn't they do this when they had complete control of the legislature and the governor's office under Scott Walker for eight years? They don't want to talk about that. And again, remember, we have a $7 billion, with a B, a $7 billion state surplus in the state. $7 billion. And yet they're dickering over 
whether to even give local municipalities a raise of shared revenue to that of inflation. Local municipalities for too long have gone with too little, in my opinion. It's time to give them their fair share of shared revenue. But the Republicans in the Assembly don't even want to have big hearings on this. They just want to push it through. They did it last night. Back with your phone calls and more after this. This is the Todd Albaugh Show. And this is Civic Media's Radio Network. The Taliban Show on the Civic Media Radio Network. It is 933 along with our producer and engineer, Mr. Aaron Zomber, is dialing up little Kenny Chesney. Always gets me in a good mood, along with a, a great message as well, right? Just get along. <laughs> That's what we just need to do. Try to get along with each other in these crazy, crazy times. If you are someone who suffers from asthma or allergies or breathing issues, just be aware. We have some smoke and haze going across the state today due to these wildfires up in Canada. Just be uh, aware that if you or someone you know and care about is a kind of a sensitive person in terms of air quality, might want to stay indoors today or at least uh, have a mask with you if you have to go outdoors. This uh, smoke and haze these wildfires will continue to move from north to south throughout the day. Uh, specifically in Richland Center today, partly sunny, a high of 76. Uh, up in Wausau this morning, partly sunny, a chance of showers this afternoon and a high of 72. And over, and over in Amory, it is going to be uh, a chance of showers most of the day and a high of 68. But again, just be aware that... Uh, this smoke, if you're looking up and saying, well, I thought it was supposed to be sunny today. It looks cloudy. It's not really so much clouds, uh, although it could be here and there. But much, much of this is kind of this smoke and haze in the upper atmosphere making its way across Wisconsin at this hour. Coming up next hour, uh, Kira Saban, our life positivity coach, is going to be in. Can't wait to have her give us another lesson in life, tell us how we can do better in terms of what we find and what, what attracts us to certain habits in our life, be it good or bad, and in personal life and in work life, and how we can improve our habits. Looking forward to Kira Saban, as always, in hour number three and the 10 o'clock hour coming up. This hour, talking about this story in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel today, that Republicans in the state legislature, in the assembly, late yesterday pushed through this shared revenue bill, this new bill, Upping shared revenue, and I'm all for that. My point, another's point, Democrats' point, is it's not enough. Particularly in light of having a $7 billion surplus. And it seems like I, you know, people are baffled by this because a few weeks ago or a couple of weeks ago, the governor came out and said, look, if we don't, if we don't kind of do better here, I'm not going to do what I did last budget cycle two years ago and just kind of take what you sent me and use my limited veto pen and, and line things out here and there and sign it and acquiesce. I'll veto the, the whole dang thing. I'll just veto the whole thing and send it back to you. Well, that got the Republicans' attention. And so they started, they started negotiating, it seems to be, in good faith. And then last night with... Not a lot of warning. They just decided to push this through, the Republicans in the Assembly. Back to this story, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. The proposal would boost supplemental aid for counties, towns, villages, and cities to use for specific public safety, public works, and transportation purposes. Hours before the Assembly met yesterday, Evers, a Democrat, said he was, quote, optimistic and hopeful about the ability to find compromise with the Republican-controlled state legislature. The message stood in contrast to his previous threat to veto the legislation over what he said was a need for more local government funding and his concerns about the bill's restrictions on decision-making by local governments. Quote, 
Today, we are in a much better place than we were just two weeks ago. All parties have been willing to set differences aside. All parties have worked to operate in good faith. And all parties have come to the table committed to finding common ground. And for that, I'm very grateful, Governor Evers said in a statement. So that's where we were just hours before the assembly decided to push this through. Apparently before the cake was baked. So it sounded like they were getting pretty close to having agreement here. And instead of waiting for the governor or his folks to sign off on it, Robert Voss and the Assembly Republicans decided just to push it through. Three Republicans joining Democrats, voting no, but still they had enough votes to get it passed on the Republican side. I haven't seen the, what, the final version of what was passed yet. Can be very curious. Remember that... Remember we talked about this, that Tony Kurtz had in there, the author of the bill from Southwest Wisconsin, Republican, that stipulation that, that in order to receive state shared revenue or an increase of it, you had to be uh, four criteria for local law enforcement agencies. Two of those criteria, of the four, included basically a quota for traffic tickets and arresting more people if you're a municipality of 20,000 or more. I mean, it just seems like a wacky idea to me to basically tell law enforcement agencies you have to write more tickets and arrest more people or you're going to get less shared revenue if you're a municipality of 20,000 or more. Don't get that. I'm assuming that stayed in the bill, but I have not, I want to make clear, I have not seen the final version of the bill. Going to be very interested to see whether that stayed in there. And don't forget, this is just the assembly side of it. Now it has to go to the state Senate where Senate Majority Leader Devin Lemihue is saying no comment or whether he even supports this version or whether he thinks he can get the votes in his Senate caucus they have a supermajority now. You'd think they could. But Senate Republicans have not signed off on this. So it is far from a done deal. And of course, Governor Evers still has his veto pen and can veto the entire bill and send it back to the legislature where Republicans are two votes short from having enough votes in the Assembly to override it. They could override him in the Senate if all the Republicans stood together. It would take two Democrats to cross over and vote with Republicans to veto the, uh, any or to override any veto on the assembly side. I don't see that happening. Devin Lemmy here, the Senate Majority Leader, told WTMJ Radio in Milwaukee that he did not think the requirement that voters approve a new sales tax for Milwaukee and Milwaukee County is the best way forward because the referendums could fail. A concern that Milwaukee leaders have also voiced. A spokesman for Lemahue did not respond to a question from the Journal Sentinel about whether Senate Republicans approve of this revised bill. A spokesperson for Milwaukee Mayor Cavalier Johnson also declined to comment. So a lot of this has to do with Milwaukee and Milwaukee County, where they are hurting in terms of how they support their public workers down there. So a lot of this, it sets up, sets up an interesting dynamic that not all Republicans are on board with what the Assembly wants to do. Meanwhile, the governor is trying to act in good faith. He thinks that they've got a deal. And Voss just kind of pushes this through. Article continues, finishes up here. The revised bill also includes language that requires new school officers to complete 40 hours of training sponsored by the National, Associ National Association of School Resource Officers. Voss told reporters yesterday the training requirement was a request from Evers, a former state superintendent and school board educator. Wisconsin community spent $2.8 billion in 2021 and $2.73 billion in 2020 on law enforcement, fire, emergency medical services, according to the State Department of Revenue. So we shall see. Again, not 
don't get too excited, I guess I would say at this point, because it still has to pass the uh, the Senate. And Governor Evers has a veto pen. What I'm more interested in is, again, this kind of seemingly lack of transparency. And if you have something, if, if, if you're in negotiations and everybody's negotiating in good faith, why do you just push the cake in the oven, or rather take it out, before it's completely baked? Why not let it sit in there another 10, 15 minutes? Why not continue the negotiations and get something the governor can actually sign and everybody can be happy? I'm all for pragmatism, by the way. I'm a very pragmatic person. I'm not an absolutist in politics or a whole lot else. I'm not someone that has that says, you know, it has to be all my way or I'm not going to do it. In politics, usually the best legislation is pragmatic. You go into negotiations and, hey, you know what? If you end up with 75 to 80% of what you went in with, you call that good. And you live to fight another day. Now, if it's something like voting rights, that's a place where I can see you take a stand. But something like shared revenue or other things, something that isn't a constitutional right, I'm all for being pragmatic. It's the way legislation actually gets done. And I think we'd be a lot better off if we had lawmakers that were willing to do that. But we should sell. What do you think? 715-388-7155. Again, area code 715-388-715. We'd love to hear what, uh, what you have to say this morning on this or, or any other issue. Well, uh, just to pick up a quick note this morning on something we talked about yesterday before the break. Somebody listening wrote, wrote, wrote this, and I won't say who, but I don't have permission to say their name, but uh, I thought this was pretty good. Yesterday we talked about no mow May. Remember that? This, uh, this effort to not mow your grass in May to protect the, uh, to protect the, the bees, supposedly. And Mr. Zomers, through his great research, found out that, in fact, when you... Don't mow. Yeah, you make a nice little home for the bees, and then you mow on June first, and you just mow them down. And you Although kill I think them. we should credit Jeff Perry for that one. Oh yes, and Jeff, and Jeff, Jeff Perry found this. Yeah, and sent it over, and Zombers put it on for us. Yeah, so Jeff Perry found this, and 100 percent right. Well, now environmentalists. Uh, somebody writes in and says environmentalists are glommed on to no mow May, not because of pollinators. That was just the rationale. It was reduced the use of lawnmowers which don't have the emissions technology of cars. Each mower spews many multiples of half-burned hydrocarbons as a car. But reactionaries like you condemn any direct ban effort, just like you condemn action of, to end gas stoves, even though they're the longest, the largest emission source in a building, which is otherwise built to modern codes and induction cooking has zero emissions and is more efficient. As they say, the most powerful force in the universe is not gravity, it's status quo. What do you think of that? <laughs> now, I, look, I don't want to go down the gas stove rabbit hole again. I like cooking on gas stoves. I just don't see a reason to, to, to ban gas stoves. As far as Nomo May, if I had heard more people talking about the environmental impact, impact of the lawnmowers themselves, then yeah, that's a great point to bring up. And that brings us to why do we still have the same grass lawns that serve no purpose when we could have better plants for the pollinators and that don't need to be mowed or mowed as often? Well, I'm all for that. I'm fine with having a proper like prairie grass lawn that doesn't necessarily have to be mowed. But I, I mean, so I mean, so I, I guess this individual wants us to go to electric lawnmowers. I'm fine with that. But I, but I go back to and I've asked people smarter than me on this issue. All these electric vehicles, electric this, electric that, they all take these lithium batteries. All right, so now they're, now they're starting to mine lithium out in California. I'm not sure the jury has reached a verdict on that, but, you know, meta metaphorically speaking, on how good all this mining is out in California for lithium. And then, you know, eventually these things will wear out, whether it's a, a battery-operated weed trimmer, a battery-operated lawnmower, and okay, so you're not having the emissions of a gas lawnmower, 
But then what happens to all these lithium batteries once the people don't want them anymore or they, they won't recharge? We just put those in the landfill or what? <laughs> that ain't going to break down in a lifetime. I talked to somebody who's smarter than me about this stuff. They say it's about a wash. Maybe slightly more beneficial to go electric. The, the feeling is that by the time we start discarding all these batteries, we'll find a way to recycle them. I hope so. Me too. <laughs> Me too. Back with more after this, including your phone calls. Stay with us. This is the Town Hall Ball Show on the Civic Media Radio Network. The Town Hall Show is now 9.50 on the Civic Media Radio Network. Mr. Zomers, what did you dial up there? That's a song that's actually pretty cool. I yeah, haven't heard I like before. That, yeah. It's uh, 41 Lawnmowers by Billy Crockett. Really? I never heard that before. Not too bad. Catchy, catchy little tune, 41 Mowers. <laughs> All right, very good. Uh, well, yeah, if you uh, want to call in and talk about lawnmowers or Todd being a reactionary, give us a call, 715-388-7155. Area code 715-388-7155. Look, I have all four electric lawnmowers. I'm all four electric stoves, electric vehicles. Uh, I think it you know saves on emissions. I just worry what happens to the batteries after they're all done. But if, you, if you're smarter than me, and a lot of people are, give us a call and give us your perspective. 715-388-7155. Again, area code 715-388-7155. Want to turn to another great story in Milwaukee Journal Sentinel today. A little lighter hearted, a little fun, but interesting. NIL has created a wild west for college athletes and businesses, according to Ricardo Torres in today's Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. A name, image, and likeness, or NIL, still relatively new in college sports, but has become a game-changing item for athletic programs and student-athletes. In Wisconsin, one of the biggest NIL athletes is UW-Madison running back Braylon Allen. In April, Pepsi-Cola of Madison announced an NIL deal with Allen, along with Tanner Mordecai. Shamiri Dikri, DK, and CJ Williams, and other Badger athletes. Quote, Pepsi and Mountain Dew have had a history of working with athletes and influencers on a national level, said Michelle Holzen, senior media strategist for WP Beverages at Pepsi Cola. For us, we saw there to be a combination where we can work with athletes as well as showcase a major partner like Wisconsin Badger Athletics. Allen partnered with Pepsi last year. As more college athletes take advantage of the business opportunities that come their way, there are some factors that they should keep in mind before making agreements. Quote, there's so much misinformation online. There's so much mis misinformation from people you think you could trust, said Joyce Anderson, founder and COO of Honest Game. Quote, what we're doing is educating the students on the college athletic pathways, but then also providing individualized academic guidance reports for students who think they may want to play in college sports. So are you familiar with this NIL name, image, and likeness? Basically, it's, it's what has allowed us to go from amateur sports in college to essentially pro sports in college. Because, of course, it wasn't so long ago in the 2000s, as you may or may not remember, when Ron Dane and Barry Alvarez and a host of others, the college football program at Wisconsin, preseason, I mean, they had a good chance, people thought, to end up and, and compete for a national championship game. And then came along the quote-unquote shoebox scandal, Black Earth, where it was alleged that some of the team members 
had gone out to Mazamani here, just outside of Madison, to this big place called the Shoebox. Great place, by the way. And, and gotten shoes and gotten a slight discount. And the allegation was that they got the discount because they were student athletes. And the, the NCAA said at the time is the rules were you cannot accept anything of value if you're a student athlete. By the way, the guy who owns the place out there in the shoebox give discounts to, every, not everyone, but I mean all kinds of people. Just ask, and, and, and usually he'd say, yeah, we'll take, we'll take a little percentage off for you. Happy to help you out. Great guy. And this was well known. That's part of the reason people went to the shoebox. Because <laughs> you could get a great price out there. So it wasn't that these few football players got a discount because they were athletes. It's just what he did for everybody. But yet it was found to be an NC violation, and some of the players had to sit out a few games, and that basically tanked Wisconsin's hope for a national championship. I know there was a time uh, in Wisconsin basketball, not so long ago, where they had a recruit come in and one of the basically interns, the Badger basketball program, went to get this recruit a bottle of water. A bottle of water. And one of the assistant coaches grabbed it before the recruit could drink out of it and said, I'm sorry, we can't, we can't let you have that. We have to go get you a cup of water from the water cooler. Because the bottle of water, whatever it was, 99 cents, a buck 25, that was something of value. Whereas a cup of water with like a coffee mug and getting it out of the tap, that was considered not valuable. That's how much they had to watch over this stuff. Not making that up. And, of course, you had student athletes like Sam Decker and, and uh, uh, Frank Kaminsky and Nigel Hayes in the basketball program. And this was replicated all over the country. He said, look, we're the ones going out there every day and earning the university the money. We should have the opportunity to make money on our own. And so there was a big lawsuit. And the Supreme Court of the U.S. basically said, look, they're right. So they should be able to go out and, and earn money off of their name, image, and likeness. The problem is that the Supreme Court nor the NCAA really came up with a whole lot of rules around this. So now pretty much is everybody fends for themselves. And there's a lot of, as the article points out here, a lot of Wild West. Article continues, technically it's the NCAA and the universities who monitor these deals. But local laws and ordinances do matter. There is a level of freedom that is involved with each deal. Quote, they're really learning as they go from a regulation standpoint, Anderson said. Per NCAA regulations, universities cannot solicit NIL deals. However, most universities have compliance officers to answer questions for students or businesses. Quote, it's definitely a little bit of a wild west right now in terms of what the NCAA is doing, as well as state legislation as to what students being comp what they're being compensated with and what types of brands they can work with and stuff like that. We have also used university, the universities as a resource. It's a wild west out there. It's an interesting topic. More in future shows. People will ask Brady Ewing his thoughts on this in a future show. We'll come back. Hour number three. Kira Saban is with us. Cannot wait. It's going to be a great hour. Join us next to the Todd Ball Show on the Civic Media Radio Network. Yeah,